I fight for peace. I shall make use of this. Think you hope you're ready. Give me ready for battle. Perfect, damn it! I shall try my level best. We make it up here. The flames consume you. Oh no! For the honor of House Wolfort. Not so fast. Haha! <laughs> Not so fast. My turn. Huh. Yes! Shall we make it a. Let me heal your wounds. Let us pry out their weakness. I will end this. Charge! Yes! Let me heal your wounds. From where shall we strike? Now I end this. Do my best. I 
I fight for peace. Watch me work. With the powers in Here me. I come. Time to work. What you? How shall I destroy you? I shall try my yes. level best. We <laughs> make it yeah. up here. For victory! Yes! Break it! For the honor of House Wolf, this ain't ideal, ideal pathetic no. I There's fight no for joy and it's easy. I will end this. It's uh. over. I fight for peace. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Sorry, had some some te technical difficulties right here. Uh, but hopefully you can all welcome hear me now. Um, it looks like we'll be starting. Hello. Hello? Uh, 
Uh, I'm just gonna close my notes for a second. Can people hear us? Hello? Yep, do you hear all of us? Yes, I hear you, Nimpo. Awesome. <laughs> they hear uh, three voices. Okay, cool. Um, Alright, sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Uh, I am Pix. Um, joining me is Little Crochet and Ninpo. Um, and we're going to try to get started again super quick because we are now a little bit behind because of technical difficulties. Hey, we had to make up time anyway. The estimate is correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Ninpo, you want to count us down? Sure. All right. Y'all ready? Yep. Give me a okay. sec. I've got it oh, later now. Yeah. Yep. I'm all, all ready. All right. Ready for countdown? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one, go. So, welcome to Triangle Strategy Square's HD 2D Tactics RPG. And a couple, and we're going to start off with a bit of a JRPG classic. We're going to be starting off, squaring off against bandits, and we'll be introduced to five different characters. Uh, first up is Serenoa, our protagonist, the sword fighter. Roland, the horseman, Frederica, the mage, Gila, the healer, and Benedict, the tactician. Yeah, this is the New Game Plus speedrun, so we are rolling our equipment from the previous game. The first thing you're going to notice is Frederica has an item called the Vanguard Scarf, which is going to let her move first. She's usually a very slow unit, but she's a very powerful magic user. Yep, and another important thing is that we had to load the game from the uh, golden route because on the other routes, uh, what happens at the end is that certain parties, certain party members will actually leave. And when party members leave your party, then they actually lose their equipment and we would have to spend time re-equipping them. So thus we need the golden route where nobody leaves your party and everyone is equipped and ready to go. So Frederica, equipped with the Vanguard Scarf, as you can see, is going to get the first turn of the fight, and she's going to open by using the Quietus, which are these one-turn new spells, and she's going to charge up her uh, TP, also known as MP or Mana in other games, to get a powerful Sunfall, and also fleet use Fleet-Footed to give everyone extra movement. Sunfall is a very powerful, very big AoE nuke, but has the downside of having to need a, need a turn to charge up. Uh, we can circumvent that, however, by using the in tandem Quietus with Benedict, and he's also going to give Serenoa a two full turn, which allows Serenoa to take two turns on his action. He is going to be showing off the Magic Stones, which are ranged AoE items that cost zero TP and are an excellent source of damage on this difficulty. He's also going to be showing off a little AI Manip there with his positioning. Normally, the upcoming bandit likes to attack Roland because he has the lower defense. But however, in this game, if you attack an enemy from the back, you get a guaranteed critical hit. And because he sees that he can get that crit and do more damage to Serenoa, he moves into that position, which allows Frederica to reach him and finish him off. The last thing to note is that you'll notice Roland here actually attacks twice on his actions. And that's because he has a passive called Opportune Attack, where if he moves at least five spaces, then he gets an extra attack. So that's going to be chapter one, and we'll be moving on to chapter two. Uh, an important thing to note is that in this transition between chapters, Roland actually temporarily leaves your party for some reason, even though he immediately rejoins after, which, as you remember, causes him to lose his equipment, and we're going to have to re-equip him in chapter two, which is a little annoying, but if we're going to have to re-equip him anyway, then we can at least take advantage of that by actually giving him a different set of equipment than usual for chapter one to get a slightly more optimal strategy. Now for a little more context on Chapter 2, we are having a celebration between the three nations, Glenbrook, Hyzant, and Esfrost. We'll be having a joint mining operation as a sign of unification after the war 30 years ago, where the three nations were actually in war over resources with salt coming from Hyzant and iron coming from Esfrost. 
Uh, during the celebration, we're going to be having a little tournament for fun, just for fun, not t totally not for the nations to sort of size each other up and see how strong they are. And for this tournament, we'll be facing off against Hyzant, when the map will be having two bosses on a small arena map. We're going to be using two new characters. The first is Narv. He is all you need to know about him is that he is a secondary mage. The other, more important character that we'll be using is Anna. Now, Anna is an assassin. She is a very full, very useful and powerful unit for the speed run. First off, she's really fast, which means that she gets to act early, and she also gets to act twice. And she, what the ability act twice that she has, she only gets to move once, but she gets two actions on her turn, which means that, for example, she can throw two items compared to the one that other p other characters usually can do, which effectively doubles her damage output. You also see that we have a few unskippable dialogue cutscenes. This is because there are certain dialogue options that you choose, and depending on which one you pick, they will raise different convictions, either utility, morality, or liberty. And this, on your first few playthroughs, influences your ability to recruit certain characters or influence characters to vote certain ways that in that you'll see in the next chapter. But since this is a new game plus route and we have all our convictions maxed out, that won't really be relevant. Yeah, we don't need to worry about grinding any of that stuff out, thankfully. We've already gotten all the good characters and also all the bad characters. So as you can see in this map, there's basically two groups of enemies. They're gathered up nicely in a little diamond formation. And so what we can do right now is, once again, take advantage of the Vanguard Scarf with Frederica, and she's going to get an immediate scorch off on the left group, and Narv is going to get to scorch the right group for tons of immediate chip damage. We also lock down that boss, Exam, with the Missed Opportunity Quietus, and by locking him down, we prevent him from taking an attack animation by attacking Frederica. And we also demonstrate why it's so important to kill enemies quickly before they get to take any turns, because since they're all dead, they don't get to take up time by moving or Ta or taking attacks. Yeah, All using that's left the quietest, is for Roland to finish off these bosses with his double thrust. Using the quietest takes a little extra time, but in the sum total we get to skip Exham moving and attacking Frederica, and whenever you have two units on either side you get a pincer attack, um, so because of the alignment we also get that pincer attack animation too, so it all kind of adds up to make up the time to use the quietest. Yep. So, with the conclusion of the tournament, we are now met with the first route split of the game. Now, one of the uh, main mechanics of this game is these route splits, where characters vote using the scales of conviction uh, to choose which way the story will be going. And on this route split, we have the choice to either escort Hyzant or Esfrost back home and give our thanks. And for this, we're going to be choosing to go with Hyzant. And thankfully, Hyzant is the actually the default vote, so we don't have to take the time to convince any of our allies. We can just skip right to the vote. So we go off to visit Hyzant, and we see that they are tutored for their equality, and we see it as a very, very happy place, at least on the surface. But something doesn't seem quite right. We're not quite sure what yet, but we'll be finding out in a timely fashion. Now, as we jump into uh, Chapter 3, we're going to once again be making strong use of the Vanguard Scarf with Frederica. As normally the boss uh, gets to go first, and because he gets the first turn, he gets to run away from our army, and normally you would have to chase him down to catch him. Since this is actually a kill boss map, we don't actually have to kill all of the enemies, only the boss. But because we're on New Game Plus, we have a Vanguard Scarf, what we can do is that we can take advantage of the Quietus and use Light Wave to warp Frederica up to the boss, like Pix is about to show us right here. 
And then we can one-shot him with the Blazing Chains attack as he is an Ice Mage and thus has the elemental weakness to fire. And that's going to be chapter three. Yeah, it's initial 30%. Um, Frederica can choose to spec into increased damage for Scorch, which is the AoE attack, or increased damage for Blazing Chains, which is the single target. Um, so by specking into the single target and the 30% additional fire damage for the weakness, um, that's enough to one-shot Plinius on this difficulty. Yep. And then as you see there, when you first complete this chapter, uh, you'll recruit a new character named Quarantine. He's an Ice Mage. If you went to S Frost, you would recruit the Archer Rudolph. We already have both characters, but we still have to sit through that little dialogue anyway. And Quarantine, he's usually a pretty good unit, especially on the higher difficulties, but on this difficulty and in the speedrun, we actually don't really have a need for his specific talents, so we won't really be seeing more of him. But I think he deserves a little break anyway for carrying the higher difficulties, so he can get a bit of rest. He's cold, Frederica. <laughs> yeah. Yep, even if that has access to a similar ability to Sunfall, which is Glacial Moon, it's a little bit weaker, but it does not have the charge up time. Unfortunately, there's only one Vanguard Scarf to go around, and he also has low speed like Frederica, and we don't have enough resources to patch that up, so Frederica is all we're really going to be using for that. So, moving into Chapter 4, we are going to be visiting our friend Dragan in the mines. He's running the mine operations. We're coming to say hello to him, give our thanks, and to see how the mining operations are going. But we are soon going to get ambushed, actually, and this is going to be the first more complex uh, Kill All Enemies map. We're going to be seeing these are four new characters. We have Huet, she's a flying archer, she's going to shoot a guy. And Piccoletta, she is another item thrower. She, Unlike other characters, she can throw items farther than others and also do more damage with them. The last two units are a lot more interesting and far more important for the speedrun. The first is Medina. She's another item user, but a more supportive unit. She can, Whenever she uses healing items, she can actually bestow upon them TP. And she can do this twice by using an ability called Double Items, which effectively means she can give, she can battery TP for up to five units, and that's going to be really important to keep uptime on our abilities. The other benefit of Double Items is that she can actually use it offensively, which we'll see in this map, and she can throw two stones instead, which basically allows her to replicate Anna. So Frederica is going to use the Vanguard Scarf once again to charge up Sunfall, Light Wave in to this group of enemies, and charge up a Sunfall to wipe them all out. The Anna, meanwhile, is going to work on this group of enemies, chipping them down with her two Firestones, and then we'll have Medina and Huet finish them off later. Benedict also has an ability called Now. It basically replicates the In Tandem Quietus. We have him use that ability because we need the In Tandem Quietus on this turn. This is Milo, the last new unit that we're deploying. Her main uh, ability is Moon Jump right here, which allows her to jump across five spices especially over these hard-to-navigate areas like that gap. And she can go straight to that archer to attack him. And then hopefully this NPC unit, Dragan, uh, will then finish him off with a Scorch. However, sometimes he just doesn't feel like cooperating and won't attack, which is really unfortunate when that happens. Yeah, it's about a 15-second time loss if Dragan yep. decides he doesn't want to live. Yep, but looks like Pix was, lu Pix was lucky with it. Let's hope that the same happens to Shay. And then lastly, we have Piccoletta and Serenoa finish off that group of enemies. All right, it looks like they both got the good RNG, so no unfortunate Dragan shenanigans there. So after, after getting uh, ambushed by Esfras there, they're then going to move on to actually invade the Kingdom of Glenbrook, which is where our party is currently residing. And thus, we need to get out of there. We need to escape as Roland, our horseman, is actually the prince. And we want to make sure that he's okay. So this is going to be actually going to be the first cheese map of the game. The objective of this map is actually to have Roland escape by reaching a certain area. And normally, you have to solely escort him there. But since this is New Game Plus, we have access to tools that on the first playthrough you wouldn't have access to. And all we really need to do is give him the two full turn buff with Benedict. And then we buff up his movement with Fleet Footed and warp him over with the Light Wave Quietus. And then 
You'll be able to see he can reach the escape point no problem at all. Yeah, 5 and 6 are two of the biggest cheese maps. <laughs> two of the ones that get the most broken by New Game Plus. Yep. And we, 15 as well. Yep, as we'll see later. But yep, we also see him use the ability Rush right there, which allows him to you move four extra spaces through that barricade. And you also notice that Pix uh, did something interesting. He used his mouse to control where Roland was moving. The mouse is an interesting control scheme. Uh, normally, uh, you would have to scroll your cursor over, but the mouse lets you directly uh, select your target destination. And that sounds great and faster, and it is. And you might be wondering why we aren't using that more often. And the reason for that is, well, this game was very clearly not made for the PC. It was made for the Switch, actually, and then ported to PC. And because of that, the mouse's controls are actually really clunky, especially when you want to select a tile that is outside of the camera's range. So while it is technical optimal, it, technically optimal, it is not very convenient to use. Yeah, it's really awkward if they're not on the the camera, and also depending on how you have the camera turned, it's there's a lot of spaces. It also kind of lags a little bit. Um, like if you're trying to do troop selections on there, it, it kind of lags a little bit moving from one unit to the next. Um, so it's a little clunky, but there's a few places where we make use of it. Yep. Now this next chapter, the uh, the objective of this chapter is to seize the target area. And what that means is that we need at least one of our allied units to be in the target area, and we need to eliminate all enemy ally enemy units in that area. Now how this chapter normally goes is that you're supposed to open the gate to reach that area, and when you open the gate, reinforcements will actually spawn. But if you warp through it with using something like Lightwave, then all you have to do is eliminate those two enemies like that, and the reinforcements never actually show up. So that's another quick clear. Definitely after we not how they intended it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, after we complete Chapter 6, this is sort of where the tutorial ends for the game, and where the game really starts to pick up both story-wise and gameplay-wise, either in standard play or speedrun. We enter another branching path, as Frost has finished invading the capital and is now moving onto our domain, the Wolfert domain. And we are given another branching path where we have to choose to either give in to their demands and surrender Roland, or we have to protect Roland from the invading mighty general Avlora. And we're going to choose to protect Roland, as we actually have a little trick up our sleeve that will make defending him much easier than you might think. In fact, so much so that, narratively, you would think that surrendering Roland would give you an easier time, but it actually gives you a way harder map if you choose to go that route. Yeah, the other map you get has a very, very unfortunate height mismatch for you, and a lot of archers and a lot of terrain that can be set on fire, um, and it's really hard to clear very quickly. Um, the combination of this one, and then also, uh, be, depending on what you choose for 7 effects, what you get for 8, um, we also get a very fast 8 on this route for 7. Yep. You'll see that we have to take the time to convince somebody for this, to get this version of chapter 7, but it is more than worth it. So the important thing to note about this chapter is that this is where more standard reinforcements start to show up. They sh Reinforcements show up after you kill a certain amount of enemies, but what's important about them is if you were able to wipe out all the enemies on the map at once and just win, then the reinforcements won't show up and you effectively skip those reinforcements. So this is where that little trick bar sleeve is going to come up into the play. These, the little trick bar sleeve is that we have some fire traps set out throughout the map. And any units, ally or enemy, that get caught in them when they get set off will be immediately wiped out from the map. So our main challenge for this map is going to be figuring out a way to trick all of the enemies to get baited into the traps and then set them off all at once so that they will all be eliminated on one turn. So we're going to be seeing a couple new units. Uh, we're going to be deploying, most importantly, a new unit named Kohog. Now Kohog is a basically a space and time mage. Most, uh, his most notably most notable abilities that you'll see right now are the ability to warp allied units and the ability to swap with either ally or enemy units. 
And that la uh, second one is especially important because the boss, Evlora, doesn't really want to move, which means that uh, that swapping ability is the only way that we can get her into the traps. Yeah, Evlora is the only character whose AI is smart enough to realize the traps are there. Yep. So we have to give her something that she really wants, which is a free shot on a very squishy mage. Yep, so after we warp uh, Maxwell closer to the fire traps, we're going to have him do the only relevant combat in the map, which is going to be a critical hit high jump. And what that critical high jump is going to do is kill one enemy sword fighter. And we need to kill that guy because if we left him alive, there would be actually be no more room left for him in the fire traps. And when we set the fire traps off, he'll still be alive and reinforcements will spawn. The other benefit to the high jump there is that you see it also advanced him five tiles and it lets him move into that specific position, which is very important as it is how we can bait all the enemies to get there. We're also going to warp in Kohog so that he can swap places with Avora and function as the second shark bait. We're also going to have this new character Julio uh, give TP to the other new character Giovanna who's going to set off the fire traps. The uh, reason that we have to put Maxwell into that specific position is this shield bearer right here. He has very low movement, and that's the and that position is the only way that we can bait him into that fire trap. Now, with all the enemies about to move into position, we have Giovanna move down and use the ability Gaia's Roar, which basically has infinite range in a cross shape, and it is able to trigger both traps. And there's the map. Kohog and Maxwell get caught too, but don't worry about them. They'll be okay. They'll be perfectly okay. Yeah, there's no insta-death in this game, thankfully. Yep, so they will be right back with us, no problem at all, in the next chapter. Yeah, this was a, a really nice routing uh, <laughs> invention by Ninpo, who was one of the more recent members to join the community. Um, it's just like this route has just continued to evolve so much because people bring fresh eyes to maps and give us new things to consider that we hadn't really thought of um and so now seven is incredibly fast yep it's worth noting that that strategy is actually only available on the non-golden route because if you want the golden route you're actually not able to use those traps so you have to do a slightly different slower strat in order to wipe them all out that strat we'll be seeing used later in the run Speaking of which, that was a gold seven. Let's go. Very nice. <laughs> so as we move into chapter eight, we'll see the other benefit of choosing that version of chapter seven. And that is that it allows for this branching path, which is the which gives us the only version of chapter eight that is a kill boss map rather than kill all enemies map, which is good because as you can guess, it's way faster to kill only one enemy instead of all of them. Especially this particular enemy. Yeah, this particular enemy, <laughs> um, you can, depending on how your, what choices you pick for your branching paths, you can fight him pretty often. No matter how many times you kill him, he just keeps coming back. Instead, it does also not, doesn't also apply to him. <laughs> <laughs> Even the final time that you kill him, he still doesn't die. He just runs away forever, never to be heard from again. So, we... Uh, are going to see that. So what happens in this uh, branching path is that after that invasion from S Frost, we receive a we receive a proposal to get aid from the Telior domain. But the thing about the Telior domain is that they are kind of sketchy, and we see right through that, and we say no, we don't want any of that, and they are not very happy. So they send this mercenary named Rufus after us, and we need to defend ourselves from him. But we see that he is kind of a joke, as we are going to warp Frederica straight to him with the Lightweight Flytus, and wear him down with the Blazing Chains attack once again. He's such a good mercenary that he doesn't even try to hit you, he just yells at you. Yep, even though he could just bonk the squishy Frederica right there, he just doesn't really do anything. He just walks forward one space and that's it. And lets him get finished off by Frederica just like that. So while we were able to defend ourselves uh, from Telior, we still haven't received any aid, which kind of sucks. 
But thankfully, Hyzant is going to come through for us, and one of the saintly seven of Hyzant is going to offer us a lot of money and resources for us, which we are very thankful for. However, as we all know, nothing in life is free, and he wants us to do some shady business for us, because he is actually smuggling salt to get some extra profits for his own pockets. And we are met with another branching path where we can either go along with it or we're going to instead turn on turn on him and turn him into the rest of the Saintly Seven. And for this, we're actually going to choose to turn him in, even though gathering the evidence, even though we don't really have much evidence to convince the others of that. This is also another default vote, which is great, so we don't have to waste any time convincing anybody. Yeah, we're very bravely going to tattle. <laughs> now, this version of this upcoming version of Chapter 9 is actually really tricky on a first playthrough, especially. It takes place in a valley, and you actually start at the very bottom, which means you have the low ground, and you are completely surrounded by enemies on high ground, which normally means that they get to just start bullying you with arrows from their archers. But we're on New Game Plus, and we can actually use that low ground to our advantage by, to, by using a character known as Decibel. Decibel, if you are familiar with the Final Fantasy Tactics games, is basically the calculator class. What that means is that he has abilities that have massive amounts of range, but the catch is that it can only hit enemies if they fulfill certain conditions. They either have to have HP that is divisible by 3, 4, 5, or end in 7, or, in the case of this map, they have to be at least 5 units above decimal. And since we're on the low ground, that's going to be basically everyone in reach. He does have a few other weaknesses. Uh, for one, he is pretty slow, so we have to use abilities like in tandem to accelerate his turn, so we don't have to sit through enemy turns. And he also is the only character in the game that does not naturally regenerate TP. So we need to deploy both Medina and Julio in order to keep uptime on his abilities. As you can see here in that little battle preview, this, you saw that there's pretty high ground up there, but we're going to be way lower. So Frederica is going to start us off by chipping down the boss significantly with a Blazing Chains to put him in range of Decimal's follow-up attacks. And you're also going to see Medina use another new ability called Fast Acting Medication after Kohog brings this archer into range of Decimal. Because while his attacks have a lot of range, it's not infinite and we do need to bring some enemies closer. Now, Medina's ability, Fast Acting Medication, is basically the same as the In Tandem Quietus and Benedict's Now ability. It accelerates the turn so that we can have Decimal immediately use that ability and hit almost everyone on the map. Once we have Julio uh, use In Tandem on Decimal and feed him more TP to do it again, we can watch all of the enemies just suddenly disappear, or at least most of them. There are a few enemies that were just outside of range of Decimal's attack, and we're going to have to finish them off with Serenoa and Frederica. Kohog's positioning also is doubly effective because not only did it bring an enemy closer to put in Decimal's range, but it also baits these enemies to line up nicely for Frederica to finish them off with the Pillars of Fire ability, which hits in a horizontal line. Now, it's worth noting that if you were lucky, you saw that Archer attacked Kohog and it triggered some dialogue from Serenoa. But if you're lucky, that Archer will actually just move and not attack at all. And it's a nice time save as you don't have to watch that dialogue happen. It doesn't happen very often, but if you're lucky, it's very nice. 
Yeah, I saw Shay get that RNG, like, very recently, and I don't think I had ever seen it before when I thought she was making it up. Yep. <laughs> it's yeah, she got, very, like, very all, she got, like, all the good RNG in that run. It was very surprising to see. So now that we are, have reached Hyzant, we are now in a phase where we have to try to gather enough evidence to convince the others of Sorcely's guilt. This opens up another route split, where you either get enough evidence to prove Sorcely's guilt, or you don't, and you have to face a trial instead. We choose to take the route that does not that it does not sufficiently get evidence to prove Sorcely's guilt. And, but it's worth noting that this route split is actually not trivial because while this does give us a faster map, it also gives us a lot of text boxes that we have to sit through as that trial is pretty long. And the other route split, the map is longer, but it isn't that much longer. And in fact, to this day, it is something that we are still investigating. Yep, as you can see, you have to convince every other member of the Saintly Seven of Sorcerer's Guild. We just mash through and try to get through it as fast as possible, but as you can see, it was a lot of time spent sitting through dialogue. However, our reward for that is this pretty small map. It only has a few enemies, and we can take care of them pretty quickly. We're going to bring back Giovanna and have Frederica and Cerno take care of the rest of the enemies while Giovanna will finish them off. Yeah, I mean, you can go through and, like, even prove Sorcery's guilt. Um, the, the route splits where you, like, prove it, like, 90% of the way, but you, like, prove him guilty and you still wind up in trial by combat anyway. Yeah, the only difference is that if you successfully convince them all, they just give you an item. And not yeah, even a very good uh, one. <laughs> yeah, it's just gonna clog up our inventory. Yep. So we don't want it. Um, yeah, that map has a lot of spikes we saw on the side, um, and so it gives you an item to prevent you from getting knocked back into them, but we kill the enemies before that becomes too much of an issue. Yep. And there's Giovanna finishing off the rest of the enemies. Uh, Shay actually ended up using one of the newer strats. Uh, Pix used the older one that used Missed Opportunity to skip uh, the boss Sorcely's turn, but Shay used the newer version that where Serenoa just immediately kills him with a critical hit. So after that trial by combat, uh, Sorcery is gone, and now there is a seat open in the Saintly Seven. And they actually put Sereno in there, which seems good, but what that really means is that now they can try to peer pressure Sereno into obeying them. And they're... But before we go into that, we're actually going to use that position of power to see what exactly is the truth behind Hyzant. And it turns out it's uh, really not pretty. Uh, we go into an exploration phase, and we will briefly enter the source, which is where the Hyzant harvests all of its salt. And what we find out is that Frederica's people, known as the Roselle, are actually being held in slavery in order to harvest the salt for them. And that's not very good. And what's even worse is that now Hyzant is going to demand that we turn in the Roselle residing in our domain over to them, as there are some that are residing in our domain thanks to our father. But we're obviously going like, the heck bro, no, we're not going to do that. And we choose to protect them. Yeah, um, it's the right thing to do, and coincidentally it's faster. Yep, because the most notable thing about this chapter is that, about this route split, is that it actually causes Chapter 12 to not be a combat map, but instead just be a brief exploration instead. So, and this, so that means that this is, once again, another ironic case where, story-wise, you would think that turning over the Roselle would give you an easier map, but it turns out not only did you just, did you just sell out the Roselle completely, but you also just made your life harder. So this upcoming map is another map with reinforcements, and they are especially difficult to skip because once you kill five enemies, they'll spawn, and they're all pretty spread out, so it's pretty difficult to do. And for the longest time, the speedrun actually did fight them, until very recently. 
And we managed to kill them all by once again taking advantage of Decimal. But the tricky thing is that we need to use his ability that targets enemies that have HP divisible by 3. So our main challenge here is to not only do we need to chip all the enemies into range to die to Decimal's attack, but we have to chip every single one of them to specifically have HP that is divisible by 3, which is not easy. We start off by doing something pretty unusual. We have Frederica use Sunfall, but only with 3 TP instead of 5, and that's because Sunfall actually does more damage depending on more TP you have. And when it only has 3 TP, it leaves all the enemies that she's about to target alive, because we're trying to avoid killing enemies, so reinforcements don't spawn. And thankfully, it also leaves a few of the enemies with HP divisible by 3. Anna's going to be warping over down there to start working on those groups of enemies. Now, the, of course, since we're using mostly using AoE attacks to chip all the enemies, it's inevitable that some enemies will end up dying due to the collateral, but that's just something that you have to deal with as you try to as we try to precisely wear everyone down. It's a very, very tight and specific and precise map clear. Yeah, it's the most interesting thing about we very recently rerouted some of the accessories for different characters, including Archibald and making sure everybody landed on an even multiple of three was an important thing to check for. Uh, it actually matters where you move Archibald on this map because he does different inescapable arrow damage at different spaces. So we found a way, we found a different spot to move him to to get the damage output we needed. Yep, and we also, and also there's Piccoletta's ability to throw items farther than other characters comes into play as she's able to just barely reach that group of enemies. You also saw an NPC unit who moved closer and triggered a conversation with Frederica on Pixie's stream. That is another bit of RNG where sometimes, depending on where he moves, he will trigger that conversation or he won't. Yeah, we try to move characters into that specific particular space around Frederica to not trigger it, but it doesn't always work. Yep, uh, that's going to be chapter 11, easily my favorite chapter of the speedrun. And here we get to enter chapter 12, where as you can see, it's mostly just going to be all story cutscenes and no combat needed. So a very easy decision on which version of chapter 11 we want to go to. Now, as we move into ch chapter 13, we had now have access to a new powerful advanced uh, weaponry from Hyzant. It is an explosive called Alfric. And our next route split is going to be deciding how exactly we want to use that Alfric to reclaim Gunbrook. And we are going to choose Benedict's option, which is to destroy the dam, flood the city, and flood out all the soldiers, which uh, sounds pretty messed up, and it is, but hey, you know, it's the it seems to be the first time that the questionable thing seems to finally give us the easiest maps, so I guess there's well, finally some consistency. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. So the reason that we choose this route is that the other two routes, they have one kill all enemies map, and then one kill boss map but this route actually replaces the kill all enemies map with instead a seize the area map which as you remember all we have to do is get one element one allied unit into that area and make sure that there are no enemies there it's also another default vote which is great because we don't have to take the time to convince anybody and it is in my opinion the biggest cheese map it yep, is. if you yep. <laughs> yeah. This just like ch chapter five, uh they would they were both uh, among the first maps that were ever cheesed when the game first came out. I'm actually not even sure which one was cheesed first. They were both uh skipped basically on like the first week. Thank you. 
So the main reason that this cheese strategy works is that unlike chapter six, there's actually only one u enemy unit in the target area that we need to move. And if you remember, we have a certain character that has an ability to swap places with enemies. And that is indeed Kohog. So all we have to do is get him close enough and then he can use that ability to swap places, which will both get rid of the only enemy unit that is in that area, and also place an allied unit in the area to seize it for ourselves. So we're going to have Benedict give him the two-fold turn buff, the fleet-footed quietus to increase movement, and the light-wave quietus to warp him up there. It's also important that we sneak past this spotlight into that specific tile right there on Shay Stream, which will prevent the... Uh, enemy scouts from detecting him and therefore not trigger reinforcements, which would be slow. We then move up to swap places with that enemy, and there we go, chapter 13. Now there is a small downside to doing this chapter, which is that the game goes, Dude, you picked a pretty messed up option. You need to see the consequences of your action. So we're going to see another unskippable cutscene where you watch your own your own city getting flooded because of your actions. So as you can see right there on shade screen, behold, the consequences of your actions. And now we can finally skip it. So now we are going to go and try to reclaim the capital. And we're going to be met with two bosses named Erica and Thallus, who are usually presented as pretty awful uh, humans. They are especially awful to their uh, half sister, Frederica. And even they are like, dude, what the heck? What did you just do? And we're going to say, uh, none of your business, and we're going to take care of them real quickly. We are now going to be seeing the torch being passed from. Frederica to Roland as the primary damage dealer, as he's going to be doing both of these boss kills. And this is also the reason that we had to do that re-equip on Chapter 2, so that Roland can reach the killing thresholds for these two bosses. You can see that after Frederica's chip on Erica, you can finish him off with the double thrust ability, and then he's going to actually be able to one round Thallus completely using his ultimate attack for dragons, which is a very powerful attack that actually ignores enemy defense. And just like that, that is chapter 14. Yeah, we used to do that equip here in chapter 14, but um, knowing what we know now about how Roland loses his equipment after one, and knowing, like, since we have to go into the menu anyway to swap in Narv onto that map, we go ahead and do the equip there since we're already in the screen. Which is yep. Just a very small optimization. Yep, and it allowed for a slightly more optimal Chapter 2 compared to the previous one. So now that we're moving into Chapter 15, we have another route split comes up, and this is the first special route split that is going to see certain party, certain, uh, party members leave our party temporarily because they each want to do different things. Benedict wants to go back home to visit your father, uh, Lord Simon. Uh, Frederica wants to visit the Roselle village and check up on them because they heard that bandits were actually attacking them. And Roland wants to remain in the capital to investigate the corrupt nobles. And we are going to be staying with Roland. Bennett, so, so that means Benedict and Frederica are going to be leaving our party, and that's part of the reason that the torch has passed from Frederica to Roland as our primary damage dealer. And the reason that we choose this route split is that uh, one, Benedict's map is the only version of uh, this chapter 15 that is a kill all enemies map, and obviously that's a no-go. So the choice is between Frederica and Roland's kill boss maps. And you need to remember that while it is important, while it is very nice to have kill boss maps as you only have to kill one enemy, you also need to have a good boss killer in order to make those bo kill boss maps fast. And Roland is the best boss killer, and we don't, and on the other maps you would lose Roland, so we want to take Roland's route so that we keep our best boss killer. Yeah, and since Frederica has left our party, that also frees up the Vanguard Scarf for us. So we're going to see that move in this chapter. Yep, because that was that previous chapter was actually the last time that we will be deploying Frederica. So 
But we still do want to take advantage of the Vanguard Scarf as that is a very important item. So we'll be moving it to another character. In this case, it is going to be Kohog, that time and space mage. And since we're doing re-equips, we might as well do another re-equip here. We are going to be moving the Movement Bangle, an item that gives the character plus one movement, from Kohog to Milo, which she will be making use of in Chapter 19 for a small time save. So here's another kill boss map. The boss Patriot is a little bit far away, and he usually moves first, and he runs even farther away, which is why we need the Vanguard Scarf on Kohog. That allows him to immediately swap places with the boss to bring him close enough to Roland to finish him off. And the positioning that we uh, use for this is very specific. We move him so that the boss is only four spaces away from Roland. And that's important because we actually do not want to trigger his opportune attack passive. We want to one-shot him with four dragons instead. This is important because opportune attack will do an attack but not kill him. And what that would do is trigger a dialogue between Patriot and Roland. And we don't want to deal with that because that would waste time. So we just want to go right to the four dragons as we don't need the extra chip damage from opportune attack. Yeah, sometimes we want it, sometimes we don't. Moving into chapter 16, we are reunited with Benedict and Frederica, and both of them bring news. Uh, Benedict comes back with information that you are actually the son of King Regna giving you a legitimate claim to the throne. That information is not going to be relevant in this specific ending that we're going for, but it is relevant in other endings. Frederica is going to come back and reveal to the truth that, surprise surprise, the Roselle that uh, Hyzant's religion is a lie and the Roselle are being wrongfully oppressed. What a surprise. And she also comes with news that there may be something important in the mines that could completely strip Hyzant of its power. And we might want to get our hands on that. So we are going to be heading right back to the mines. So we, as we enter the mines, we're going to find out that uh, Esfrost was that had already caught on to what was inside the mines and they don't want us there. So they're actually going to be sacrificing their own lives in order to seal off the mines and prevent us from getting in. And we don't want that. So instead we are going to have to stop them by wiping them all out before the bombs can go off. This upcoming chapter has a pretty notorious reputation for being really tedious due to the enemies all being really spread out and having multiple waves of reinforcements. And as you remember, we like to skip reinforcements by wiping all enemies out at once, but because the enemies are sp so spread out and you can't really kill that many enemies before the reinforcements show up, we are going to be using that strategy that I talked about back in Chapter 7. This is the Kohog and Izana combo that we will be employing. Uh, Izana has an ability called Rite of uh, Thunderstorms. It is a charge-up ability like Sunfall that hits every enemy on the map, but at a catch. First off, it is not strong enough to one-shot most enemies, particularly enemies that have higher magic resistance. So we have to use the rest of our allies to chip everyone down to put them into range. The other downside is that this attack has really, really horrible accuracy. And in order to guarantee that it actually hits all of the enemies, we need to use Kohog's time spells this time, particularly the ability to stop time. This inflicts the stop condition on every single unit, allies included, and enemies that are stopped uh, are guaranteed to be hit. So by using stop time to guarantee that we hit them, uh, Izana is able to wipe out all the enemies all at once. The downside to this, of course, is that since everyone gets stopped, you have to sit through a lot of stop animations for both your allies and, and enemies. You see that also there are a few bombs placed throughout the mines. These are the actually just a loss condition. If you if too much time passes uh, before you defuse them, then you immediately lose the map. But thankfully, it's only a loss condition and not a win condition. So we don't have to spend any time defusing them. Yeah, you also see that uh, Izana has to summon rain. She has to make it rain. 
that's because she has a passive ability that gives her extra lightning damage uh, whenever it's raining. And that extra damage is important for beating the kill threshold. There's also the enemy closest to Saranoa um, would live on 11 HP. Um, so we also need to give Azana an item just to bump her magic attack just slightly. Yep, you're going to be seeing Kohog use an enchanting spice to give her just a little bit more magic attack. You also see right here why we generally try to avoid using this combo. As you can see, we have to wait for all of these turns to pass before we can use the finisher. Yeah, I like the way you referred to it before as the baseline strat. Yep. It, theoretically, you think that, well, you want to kill all the enemies? This is what you do. Any strategy that you come up with for a, for a chapter must be faster than this strat. So we investigate the mines and gasp, there's salt in here. That's very important. And now that and now that leads into the big dilemma in chapter 17. How are we going to use this salt to shape the future of the continent of Norzelia? Roland, Frederica, and Benedict all want to do different things. And all of them, certain party, either Frederica, Roland, or Benedict cannot agree with another one under any circumstances, and this is going to be the split between which ending you go for. And in this case, we are going to be going with Roland's ending, also known as the utility ending, as it is the fastest. The reason that is the fastest is because the other, the other endings have two kill all enemies map and one kill boss map. But Roland's ending replaces one of those kill boss maps, the, one of those kill all enemies maps, with a, boss, a kill boss map. where we permanently lose Frederica as well. Yep, she just cannot agree with that because <laughs> uh, Roland's ending involves siding with Hyzant, which, as you remember, they have been oppressing the Roselle, which are Frederica's people, and, well, we end up selling them out, and, well, she just, that's just, that's just wrong, man. So yeah. I can't really blame her, to be honest. We chose our best friend over our wife, but to be fair, we just met her 50 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, the things also, we do for time saves <laughs> I also failed the boss of chapter 17 which is a save menu which requires you to input the opposite way that you've been inputting for the entire game yeah if it's something that you have to very consciously be aware of as you face it you can't just yeah. you oh, can't mash just mash it through it like you usually would <laughs> yeah the route notes save menu boss yep. yep and there's Frederica bye Frederica Another reason that Roland is our main damage dealer now. So now that we have allied ourselves with Hyzant, uh, we are going to be marching on to Esfrost, the ones who actually started this whole war in the first place, and take revenge on them for invading Glenbrook once and for all. So the first obstacle in our way is going to be uh, getting past uh, Twinsgate, a massive barrier that is being uh, washed over by Sikris, the constable. And this is the reason that the chapter that this route is faster, because this is the kill boss map that on other routes would be a kill all enemies map. Yeah, the in the cutscenes they're telling you it's kind of noteworthy that Sikris is here and not Lord Svarog, who is supposed to be in charge of Twinsgate. Um, we don't know where he is. He probably is probably not important. He probably won't show up. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No need to worry about him at all. So while on other routes, you would have to be slowly dealing with a massive amount of enemies, trying to kill them all at once using that slow Kohog and Izana combo. On this route, we can just warp rolling right up there and one round the boss using four dragons. Nice and simple. So now that we have pushed through Twinsgate, we are now going to be invading the uh, capital of Esfrost. We are going to be facing off against Gusadolf, the one who ordered the invasion on Glenbrook in the first place, and also the one who actually killed uh, Roland's family, his 
father and his father, the king, and the and the crown prince. So we'll be taking on our revenge there. Now this map, chapter 19, is really slow, really massive, and it's a massive pain to deal with. It's really big, so just reaching the enemies to kill them is a pain. But also it's completely covered in snow and ice terrain, and that gives a movement penalty to all of your units except for the flying units, of which there are only two of, and they're not really good damage dealers, so that wouldn't really help out anyway. So once again, we'll be using the Koag and Izana combo. But even then, chipping down all the enemies is difficult to do because of how far away they are. So instead, what we're so in order to deal with that, we have to have Anna use her uh, mobility her mobility ability uh, called surmount to give herself two extra movement, as you can see right there on Pixie Stream, and that lets her just get a little bit closer to the group of enemies up there, which Benedict will help her do with his with in tandem and uh, with uh, the now ability. So she's going to ship down that group of enemies right there with two Firestones, taking advantage of her Act Twice ability once again. And this is where Milo is going to be taking advantage of that movement bangle that we gave her back in Chapter 15. That allows her to reach those two enemies with a Firestone. Previously, before we had give, done that re-equip, she was only able to reach one enemy and we had to take a bit of extra time to finish off that mage in the back. And next up, you can see why this map is such a pain, because we have to sit through all of these enemy turns waiting for our next uh, unit, Archibald, to use Inescapable Arrow to one-shot that enemy healer right there, which allows us to completely skip his turn, which means we, that's one less animation that we have to sit through. And now he's, Kohog and Izana are able to uh, start their Rite of Thunderstorms combo. Yeah, it also helps because the camera kind of pans slowly between them and the camera would be moving very slowly one way, then back the opposite way. So it, it cuts some of that out for us. We also only choose to deploy eight units here because, yeah, more units could give us more damage, but it also results in more dead turns that we have to sit through. All right. Yep. And now another uh, new micro optimization that we did right there is give Anna the Amulet of Immunity. This is an item that gives you immunity to status effects and debuffs. It's usually a pretty niche item that isn't really used often, even in casual play, but it allows us to skip a few uh, animations uh, in case she got paralyzed. And also there are some speed debuffs there that would potentially slow her down and we don't want to have to deal with that. Now, while we were able to chip down most of the enemies on the map, there's still the boss that we weren't able to reach. So we're going to have to sit through some more animations and wait for Anna's turn to come back to finish him off. Time will be coming up very, very shortly. Yeah, I accidentally oh, mashed through Benedict's turn. Oh, picks. I know. Yeah, we really need Benedict to give Anna that two full turn buff right there in order to <laughs> to give her to give Anna enough damage to finish off Gustadolf as he is pretty bulky and we can only really reach him with these firestones, which while they do have the elemental weakness, uh we do need all four of them in order to finish him off. But unfortunately Benedict ends up positioning Anna slightly off because Anna has a passive ability called uh back attack damage up. And it does work with the elemental stones, and you kind of need that in order to get the extra damage to finish them off. Now we move into the final chapter of the game. We have defeated Gustadolf, but uh, turns out Svarog, who was actually there all along, he's here and he is not happy that you are invading his beloved Esfrost, and he is going. He is not going down without right, a fight. Time for he me. Is Yep, there's time for a shape. Uh, they're a little ahead uh, due to some, as the stream is a little bit behind. But uh, this is one last kill boss map. And all we have to do is use Kohog to swap spaces with Svarog right there. He's going. We're going to one last time use our uh, fleet-footed and uh, battle cry buffs to get, our, get the firepower and mobility to reach the boss. And just like that, all that needs to happen is for Roland to hit this unfortunately imperfect accuracy attack 
and hopefully land that hit and one round Sparog to complete the game. And Shay successfully connects the hit. While it is pretty high, it's like a 96% chance, Roland misses yeah. that attack a lot more often than you might think. And yeah. Roland connects for picks two, and that's going to be time for both of them. So congratulations to Shay for winning the race, and congratulations to both of our runners. Yeah, GG's. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed getting to see Triangle Strategy. Thank you for bearing with us through the uh, the technical difficulties. Um, the route just got under <laughs> one hour within the last like 24 hours, thanks to uh, some new discoveries, and we're continuing to learn and reroute. So. Uh, if you are interested, um, feel free to stop by my chat. I have a command exclamation point TS Discord, um, and you can join the Discord for Triangle Strategy. You can come talk with us about routing and, and the game. And thanks to OSC and Speed Gaming for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. We actually just very recently got the speed run to be sub one hour, and that's for this route. We were also able to. Get it for another route and we're hopefully going to be able to bring a third route down to sub one hour and get the true ending the golden route the longest one pretty close there as well yep. thanks everyone yeah thank thanks you. everyone for watching <laughs>